In this video, I want to look at an example that uses Newton's third law to solve a problem in two dimensions. So I have a block, which I will call blue, with mass m sub b, that is sliding frictionlessly along the ground with a speed of v sub i. There's a second block, which I will call red, which falls on it from above. Now when it hits, we say it doesn't bounce, but it's sliding with friction along the blue block until it comes to rest relative to the blue block. Now at that time, both are moving with the same speed in the same direction, but it's going to be different than the initial speed that blue had. And the question is, what is that speed? Well, there's a change in velocity, which means there's an acceleration that occurred, and that acceleration came from a force. And so I'm going to do a force analysis to try to solve this problem. That starts with identifying an object and applying Newton's second law. I'm going to start by looking at the red object. I'm probably going to have to look at both, but I'm going to start here. So what are the forces acting on this object? Well, there's gravity, of course. And if I draw a line around my object, the only other agent that crosses that line is the blue block. So there's a contact force between the blue block and red. Since I know there's friction, I'm going to break that contact force into a normal force and a frictional force. So here's a set of axes for my free body diagram. I know the force due to gravity points towards the center of the Earth. Now there's a normal force that points perpendicular to the plane of contact from the agent to the object, which is blue to red in this case. So I have a normal force of blue on red. Now there's a frictional force parallel to the plane of contact of blue on red, and we notice that that force is pointing to the right. Now that may not be immediately obvious. However, if we look at the system, we knew that the, the mass fell, and once it hit the blue block, which was moving to the right, the red block slid to the left until it came to rest. And so the red block is moving relative to blue So even though red was being pulled to the right, it was sliding to the back of blue, which means it was moving to the left relative to blue, which means the object was moving to the left relative to the agent, and the frictional force points in the opposite direction of the motion of the object relative to the agent. So the frictional force is pointing to the right. And the way we can confirm we know it's true is that there are no other forces in the horizontal dimension. We know at the end, the red block will get a velocity to the right, which means there had to be an acceleration to the right, which means there has to be a force to the right, and this frictional force is the only one there. In this example, red was moving to the right and being accelerated to the right relative to the ground, but it was moving to the left relative to the agent of the frictional force, which was the blue block. And it's that relative motion which is important to find the frictional force. Now we need a coordinate system, and now we can implement Newton's second law, which says the vector sum of the forces on that one object, red, is equal to the mass of red times the acceleration of red. Now before, in two dimensions, we can go into the component form with i-hats and j-hats and find the components. But I'll notice that all of the forces are in fact pointing along one of the axes. We don't in fact have to break any force into components along x and y. And that simplifies the way we look at it if we want. We can in fact go back to how we analyzed forces in one dimension and simply do that for the x and then do that in the y. So if we look in the x dimension, there's one force, the frictional force. The magnitude of that frictional force is equal to the coefficient of friction times the normal force of the blue on red. And from my free body diagram, that's pointing in the positive x direction. That's the only force, so it's equal to the mass of red times the acceleration of red. And again, that's the total acceleration. The entire system is constrained to move along one dimension, which I've ascribed as the x-axis.
Now, if we look in the y dimension, we have the force due to gravity, whose magnitude is the mass of red times g, and it's pointing in the negative y direction. Then there's the normal force of blue on red. I've defined that magnitude to be n sub r, and that's pointing in the positive y direction. And the acceleration in the y is zero. So I have two equations, one for the x-axis and one for the y. Since I'm trying to find this change in velocity, I'm trying to find the acceleration of the red block. So I think I can use this orange equation to solve for the normal force and then substitute that into blue. From the orange equation, the magnitude of the normal force of blue on red is equal to the mass of red times the acceleration due to gravity. Substituting that into blue, I get this expression, and it looks like I can divide out the masses, and I find the acceleration for the red block is the coefficient of friction times g. This makes some sense. The coefficient of friction is dimensionless. At least the units of this ex expression are right. I don't have enough to solve, though. I have an acceleration, but to find the change in velocity that this creates, I need to know time, how long it took, and I don't have any way to solve that now. So I'm just going to go ahead and look at Newton's second law with the blue block and see if I can come up with other relationships. If I identify blue as my object, what are the forces on it? Well, there's still gravity. Now there's a contact force between the ground and blue. The ground crosses that line that surrounds blue. However, I know that that's frictionless, so that contact only has a component normal or perpendicular to the surface. There's also the contact force of red on blue, and I know that that force has a normal component and a frictional component, and I'll want to use both. So next is a free body diagram, where I've already put in my coordinate system. I want it the same as before. There's a force due to gravity on blue, this case, which is down. There's a normal force of the ground on blue, and that points up because the ground is the agent and blue is the object. I've added blue subscripts to my forces here so I can keep them separate from the forces I had before. Now there's the normal force of red on blue, and that points down because the agent in this case, which is red, is above blue, and then there's a frictional force of red on blue. Now this force points to the left. I know that because as red was sliding to the back of blue, blue was moving to the right relative to red. And the frictional force of red on blue then points in the opposite direction of the motion of the object, blue, relative to the agent, which is red. Now I can check that by utilizing Newton's third law, because I am going to identify that the frictional force of red on blue is the Newton's third law force pair to the frictional force of blue on red. In fact, I could sort of add, right, blue on red to make it clear that these are a Newton's third law force pair. That means they point in opposite directions, and so I can verify that they do. Now I want to use Newton's second law. I see already that all my forces are pointing along coordinate axes, so I can utilize my one-dimensional notation and just do it in both dimensions. So in x, I have the magnitude of the frictional force of red on blue, and it is pointing in the negative x direction. That's equal to the mass of blue times the acceleration of blue, since motion is constrained to move along the x-axis. Along the y, I have the normal force of the ground on blue, in the positive y direction, then the normal force of red on blue and the gravitational force on blue both pointing in the negative y direction, and the sum of all of it is equal to zero. So how should I go about solving? Should I solve y for the normal force of red on blue, substitute that into the frictional force model for the frictional force of red on blue? No. Remember, the frictional force of red on blue is the Newton's third law force pair of the frictional force of blue on red, which means their magnitudes are equal. I've already solved for that force, and I can simply substitute that in. That frictional force of blue on red was equal to mu times the normal force of blue on red, which I solve for here.
the force of red on blue is equal to the frictional force of blue on red, which is equal to mu times the mass of red times g. Substituting that into the blue equation, I now have this expression, and I want to solve for the acceleration of blue, which I can, and it's negative, the coefficient of friction, times the ratio of the masses, mass of red over the mass of blue, times the acceleration due to gravity. Just a quick check, mu is dimensionless, I have two masses in a ratio, so their units cancel, and I have the dimension of an acceleration is equal to the dimension of g, so that checks out. I now have two accelerations for both blocks. Maybe some quick kinematics will get me the right answer. I have both accelerations here. I'll look at red first. We see that they're constant, so I choose two points in time. Initial when the red block hit the blue, and final is when red comes to rest on blue. Zero and t, I'll call the initial and final time, and the time interval is just t. The initial velocity, this is all in the x dimension now, of red is zero, where the final velocity I had called just v sub f. V final then is equal to V initial, which is zero, times the acceleration times the time interval, which I've called is just T. Substituting in for the acceleration, I have that the final velocity is the coefficient of friction times the acceleration due to gravity times the time interval. Let's look at the other side. We want the same time interval, but for blue, the initial velocity was V, and then the final velocity was the same as the final velocity for red. Using that same kinematics equation for constant acceleration, I get the final velocity is equal to the initial velocity v minus substituting in for a of the blue block times t. Now I have two equations and two unknowns. I want to find v final and I don't know time, so I'm going to solve that equation for time and then substitute it into the equation on the right. Time is v final over coefficient of friction times g. I substitute that into here and I get this expression. It looks like I can cancel out the coefficient of friction and g from that second term. And now if I bring this term over to the other side, so I can combine my v finals, I have v final plus the ratio of the masses times v final is equal to the initial velocity. Now a little algebra, I want to factor out v final. Now I want to put this term uh, over a common denominator. So one turns into the mass of b over the mass of b, so I can put that over the common denominator mass of b, and now solve for v final, but by dividing both sides by that term, I get v final is equal to mass of b divided by the total mass times the initial velocity. A lot of good stuff in this example. We did Newton's second law a couple times on two objects, but we recognize that Newton's second law only applies to a single object. When we have interacting objects, we use Newton's third law to identify Newton's third law force pairs and that allowed us to create relationships between the forces in each system. And then some constant acceleration kinematics got us the right answer. Now for some foreshadowing. I want you to remember this problem in the future when we learn conservation of linear momentum.